What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Blood on the Razor Wire TV. Today, we got a guest on, spent some time in USP Canaan, spent some time in some other prisons, got into it with the Southsiders, the Mexican Mafia, and he's still alive to tell us all about it. I don't know how the hell that happens, but we'll get into his story. Project, tell the people who you are. Let's talk about you, bro. Uh, my name's Adam Shawley. They call me Project in the pen. I was sentenced to a 60-month sentence for a 922G. Um, I stole some firearms from my mother's store. My parents um, own a pawn shop and were federally licensed firearm dealers. And I've been stealing and dealing from their store my entire life. Well, I'm deeply ashamed of it, but it is what it is. Stabilize that camera for me. Okay. So you've been wheeling and dealing and stealing from your family that own this pawn shop. I mean, what? Yep. Um. Well, damn, man, it, it started, um, I've been doing it ever since I can remember, um, since the time I was about 14. So, um, I grew up in a good household, um, you know, hardworking. I got three sisters. They're all successful. And, um, I was, I was physically and sexually abused. The family didn't know about it by a, a male babysitter from the time I was about five to 10 years old. And so... I was born in 85, so come 1997, I had uh, snorted my first Oxycontin, and by 1999, um, I was in full-fledged um, needle addict, so. So you were, living, you were living in that addiction cycle? Yep. So it was whatever you had to do in order to get some money and get high? Yep. Even if it meant robbing your own parents? Yep. My first prison sentence in state prison was actually for stealing like a $10,000 diamond from my mother's store. It was returned the following day, but the state decided to pick up the charges and prosecute me. And they sent me to what they call the Bloody Mile, which is Maine State Prison. You would think being in Maine that there's not a whole lot going on, but it's an ultra violent prison as well, not compared to the feds. But um, we'll talk about that. You know, main state prison. I know there's a dude that was over there. I think he was state place there named Richard Kalowski. And he ends up killing a chomo over there and just butchers him like 80 times. Are you familiar with who he was? No, Richard Stahursky. That's my buddy. Yeah. There you go. I actually, he, he, that happened in my unit actually. So, um, he had a, he had a hallway job. So, which is kind of a good job at the state prison. He was allowed in and out of the sergeant's office, cleaning, you know, he could, he could get his hands on some things that other inmates couldn't. And there was a cholo that had a uh, hold on him and, and, and got him fired. So Richard decided to, um, I was in a one, I was a close custody inmate because when I'm in prison, I'm, they say I'm a violent inmate. Um, and he, uh, went in there and tied him to his chair and, uh, he stabbed him 81 times in the face and neck, removed his eyes. And then he walked out with the two knives in his hand. And it was a brand new female CO, and he went and tossed the two knives on her desk. I actually interviewed Richard on this channel, and I have the pictures of the victim, which we're going to start doing this page around here rather soon. And we're going to do another story about that and put the pictures up so people can see exactly what you're talking about. But I have the pictures here on my computer. Um, So, yeah, I think there is some violence over there in Maine. People are like, Maine, come on, bro. They're playing PlayStations over there, bro. Yeah, we are. We're doing that, too, but... <laughs> Um, yeah, there's, there's some, there's some characters up there. It's, it's a bit of a, a melting pot. And, uh, you know, when I went up there in 2010, um, there wasn't a lot of gang influence and stuff. It was really like dog eat dog. So, um, yeah, it was it, it, only the strong survived, but, uh, Richard, uh, he's a, he's a wild individual. That's not his only stabbing. He has multiple, multiple stabbings up there. He actually has a 30 year fed sentence after, um, he won't, he won't never live to see that though. I, uh, I know that there was also, he was implicated in another murder too. Um, with Is he? the dude during a melee. So dude's definitely off the chain, mentally unstable, bro. But you said he was your friend, right? He was my friend. Yeah. <laughs> Wouldn't sell up with him, right? Absolutely not. not best of you, bro. I wouldn't sell up with him either. So don't worry about that. So, you know, you steal this ring from your mother. Does your mother call? I mean, obviously, mom calls the cops on you. Well, she didn't. It's just the the, the ring was actually on pawn. So the lady had come in to pick it up. 
And when my mom went to get it, it wasn't there. So of course she called me and she said, bring the ring back. Well, I still had the ring. I went to bring it back and realized that it was missing. What I didn't know is that my roommate at the time had took it. And so by the time I was able to recover it and bring it back, state police had already been contacted. And how much time do you end up with for that? 18 months. So you do 18 months in the state and they put you around people like Richard. Yeah. How old were you at the time? 18 years old. 18. I, I asked you that again because I want that to resonate with people. You could be 18 years old, think you're in a sweet place up in Maine, and you're in a cell block with a dude like Richard who's got, till the sun burns out, that's running around taking people's eyes out with shanks. Yep. They have no regard for human life whatsoever. I actually am starting to believe that they like it. Well, I mean, some people can't function outside of that prison environment, right? Right. So let's talk a little bit about you get out of prison, get out of that main state prison, you come home, back on the drugs right away? Well, yeah, because I'm uh, I'm young-minded. Um, I, I'm still thinking in my mind, I can't wait to get out. I want the girl, you know, I'm in great shape. I got a 300 bench, a 450 squat. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm caught like a bat. I can't wait to get the scene and run the bag up and, hey, look at, look at Charlie, uh, you know, all this shit. And it wasn't long before um, I started going out of state and, and, and grabbing powder. And I made a sale to two undercover cops for a gram of piece of some bullshit powder. I mean, re-rock. And they turned around and gave me a four-year, a four-year flat sentence for that. And I went back. So you're back, you do the four years, you get out of jail. How long before you end up with the Fed case? Um, I got out March 2nd, 2014. Um, when I got out, I came home for a little bit, and I have a very good friend I call my brother down in Virginia Beach. He had set me up a roofing job, and so I moved to Virginia Beach and was making really good money. I was uh, They were sending me up to D.C. I was getting prevailing wages. I was making $35 an hour. Uh, my mom had gave me a nice new car. Um, I met a beautiful woman, um, proposed to her on camera, did the whole, you know, and and it wasn't long before I just started using again, started using again, and it spiraled out of control. This is where the story gets a little wild. So she decides to try to move me. She She tells me my parents own an apartment complex in Philadelphia, and we can live there for free. I go, okay, well, Philly sounds cool. Let's go check it out. I move up to Philly, and she's pregnant. Well, I have my son, and uh, she's working. I'm having a hard time maintaining work up there. And, you know, I got a little crotch rocket, and I'm riding around on my bike, and I discover an area of, of North Philadelphia called Kensington. And it's the largest open-air drug market in the country about a hundred blocks every direction of people advertising the drugs they have. And uh, I wound up down there um, trapping on a block, um, catching case after case. And when I got out of county jail, um, she had moved and decided to leave me. So I was stuck on parole on the streets of Philadelphia and I slept on the streets for about a year straight. Let me ask you something, man. You just got out. How long you been out? I, I got out last Thursday, the 28th. You're a little bit fidgety, man. I, I mean, uh, yep. Okay? I'm okay, yep. Not getting high? Nope. My parole officer just showed up. Still still dropping clean urines for him. I have that sublocate injection. Um, it's the best I've ever felt. It's not a lifelong remedy, but I'm not going back to federal prison, Chad. So if I need this for these three years, then it is what it is, brother. Hey, I respect it. Look, I did a video in Kensington. Pretty wild, crazy place. You got a hell of a story, man. You've been all over the place. And, you know, obviously it sounds like your parents got that bag, I guess you could say in street terms. Um, They love you. They care about you, trying to see you do the right thing, giving you free places to live. You end up over there in Kensington. You say you're out there trapping. Any issues out there? Yeah, I mean, it's it's crazy, bro. It's 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 some things I can't even speak about. But yeah, 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 yeah. Um, It's it's uh, there's no there's no word for it it's so 
you have your ops on both sides of you. If anybody's ever been to North Philadelphia, you know, the blocks are set up like grids. They're, they're all one ways. They're only 20 feet apart from each other. So, you know, your opposition is to your left and your right. So I got my buddy to the left, Slim. He's my friend. My buddy to the right, he's my friend. But if his stamp is blowing harder than mine, then I'm going to have to lick some shots at his block. You know what I mean? So it, let me ask you this, though. While you're down there, do you start getting high down there? Oh, am I? I'm, I'm shooting on average. So when I'm trapping, you make $10 off from every bundle. So I opened up the block. We had a two-shift block. I didn't work on a 24-hour block. I worked on a block that was two shifts. So I opened up from 7 to 3. And by, I, had, I sold right in front of the school. Um, we had a permission from the school. We had to wait for the kids to get inside. And then it was all right. All the teachers knew. Everybody knew. And I would have about 80 fiends waiting for the block to open up. And I would do probably 70 bundles my first hour. So, yeah, I was having six, seven, eight hundred all a days. But I'd wake up broke. I was shooting 50 to 100 bags of dope a day. So are you working for someone at this time? Yeah, I'm working for the block owner. So they have a hierarchy there. You have an owner of the block. Then you have what they call a caseworker. The caseworker makes $5 a bundle, but he doesn't touch. He doesn't have to be out there trapping. He'll sit in the poppy store and collect the money. So they give us what they call a sleeve at a time. They'll give us 10 bundles at a time. And then you got to go turn in and let the next trapper go. You know, I, when I was in Kensington, I never imagined that I would ever see a place like that in the United States. So I'm in Kensington. I take my boy Bill Stacks down there. As soon as we step out, bro, there's needles all over the ground. There's people like, hey, how are, I mean, these people, I mean, how are they hustling down there? How are they getting money? All the people that live there out on the street, what is their hustle? How could there be so much money in Kensington? Is it people coming from the outside or is it the people that populate the area sleeping on the ground? Yeah, well, they say there's like a about 15,000 homeless people in that encampment down there. So, um, you know, it's, 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 uh, I was actually on an interview with, um, faces of Kensington. So I'm out there. I wake up one morning and this kid walks up and he asked me to hit him. So the thing down there is hitting pe shooting people up in the neck. I'm sure you've seen it. So this kid tells me he'll give me a dollar. Now a dollar sounds like nothing, but not when they're three or $5 bags. So everything is working to get your next dollar. So I walk up and he's got this camera crew with him. So naturally I'm nervous because I'm on parole there. So um I so I tell him I'm not doing it. And the and the guy's like, Do you need some money? And I go, Absolutely. So he hands me a twenty dollar bill and I hit the kid in the neck and then he goes, All right, so how do you do it? I said, Well, I have no veins in my arms or legs. I shoot up between my toes. So I take my sneaker off, and as I'm doing it, the police walk up. And they look at me and they go, really? What the fuck are you doing? I go, it's for an interview, dude. He goes, oh, break the tip off when you're done. <laughs> and they walk away. So on the interview, the guy turns the camera around and he's like just mind blown. He's like, the police just let him shoot the dope. Like they, it's, it's wild down there. Yeah. Um, I was assaulted multiple times. I assaulted people multiple times. Um, I got. 35 staples in my head, uh, a displaced orbital fracture, a split palate, subdermal hematoma. I had endocarditis. Um, I overdosed 23 times in a five-month span. I was picked up by the ambulance 23 times and narcaned. Did you have a place to live still? Were your parents still supporting you as far as housing? Um, no, I was on the streets, but my mom's been Western Union me muddy every single day. It got to the point where Western Union cut my mother off and thought she was being scammed. She had over 50-something people on her list that she had sent money to. I didn't have an ID, so my hustle was to get somebody that has an ID and walk with me. I'd give them $5 to do it. And uh, so, um, yeah, I've been... It's not that my parents have the bag. They don't. I've been blowing my mother, my mother's retirement and hard-earned money my whole life, man. Um, fucking, it's disgusting. Damn, bro. I mean, you're a hell of a guy to interview. You got a lot more to your story than I thought. We are going to get into the Serenio thing, but just talking about Kensington and your addiction, you get hit in the back of the head, 
I mean, what do they hit you with? Um, a brick. Well, it was multiple times. So I was hit with a brick and I was hospitalized. Um, I had a, a blood clot on my brain that they had to drain where it had leaked through. So when they hit me, it, it fractured my skull on the side of my head. I had a two and a half inch skull fracture. So the blood, rather than seeping out, it had seeped underneath my skull. And I woke up and the whole side of my head was out like this. So when I went to the hospital, they had to actually drain it. But they wanted to keep me there and put me in a 21-day um, thing for IVs and stuff. Uh, for and Have me on an IV, but they wouldn't give me heroin. So I decided to check myself out. Wow, man. Uh, what did you get hit with the brick for? What was the reason? Um, God knows what. Who knows? No idea. I mean, there's so much. You do so much dirt down there that it's just, it's hard saying, Chad. It's just every day is just nonstop boosting, assaulting. It's just, it's just, a not, you're seeing it down there. So um, it's just nonstop, bro. Like, I, I assaulted so many people for absolutely nothing. I've had women walk up and say, hey, that guy stole my phone. Well, get, you got any money? I'll go knock him the fuck out. Here's $10 and run up and blindside him. You know what I mean? Just trivial shit like that. Was there ever a time when your parents came to get you? Like, look, you got to come home. Well, so, my, I have, like I said, I have a friend that I call my brother. He was in Virginia, so he had a girl come and get him from Maine was bringing him back to Maine. She goes, don't you have a brother or something that's like disappeared in Kensington? He's like, yeah. You want to go see him or try to find him? And, you know, being Kensington, they're like, there's no way you're just going to find him. So she goes down there and she starts showing pictures of me down at Kensington and Allegheny asking if they know me. Well, she's showing pictures of me when I was healthy and everybody's looking and they're like, yeah, his name's Adam, his name. So all of a sudden somebody runs up to him and goes, that ain't Adam, that's Boston. They call me Boston down there because of my accent. So she goes, I can bring you to him. So all of a sudden, I'm in this basement of this abandoned house that I trap out of. And I got a guy that guards my door with the, with a gun. We put the stick at the door with the pistol. And he opens it up and says, your brother's here. And I go, my brother? I'm thinking it's one of my buddies down at K&A. And sure than shit, it's my brother walks through the door. And they kidnapped me, you know, pretty much you're, you're coming with us. So I took the ride back to Maine and I escaped tens of in my life. Never went back. Nope. Never went back. Um, I did, I, right before this fed case, actually, I, that's where I, I did go back. That's where I ended up fencing the pistols that I stole from my mother. Addiction so strong that you could get hit in the head, 35 staples, beat up, kicked, punched, disrespected, and you still can't leave. Right, because they, the, all they were offering was 10 milligrams of methadone when I got a 10 gram heroin habit a day. Yeah, so I, I checked myself out against medical advice. How old are you now? I'm 38. 38 years old. I'm sure you've seen a lot in your life, just from the, you know, the little bit that you've that you've shared. Kensington. What's some of the craziest shit you've actually seen happen down there? We, um, I can tell us what you've seen. All right, so the craziest thing I'd seen was um, I was sitting in front of the cricket store, and, you know, we got something they call the 12 o'clock boys down there, and it's a motorcycle group. You know, their thing down there in Philly is riding wheelies, you know? So it's like 3 in the morning, and I hear shots, so I don't think nothing of it. Then all of a sudden I feel shots. I, you can feel them bitches humming by you, and all of a sudden the kid beside me at the cricket store is just – Plumped against the bars, and I'm grabbing him, and I turn, and the whole side of his fucking head's busted out. They blew his brains out. Nobody was ever caught for it or nothing. Just just a random drive-by. They seen a group of homeless people, and they rode by on the dirt bike. They had bandanas on, and and they you know they sprayed with the Draco or something fully automatic. So could have been you that night. I mean, the kid was sitting beside me smoking crack. He was four feet from me, literally four feet from me. Even an intended target, just some young kids decide, hey, we're just going to go out and pop some people tonight because we think it's cool. Well, yeah, because you got to understand the locals that live down there hate the fact that there's all these white people homeless down there that are fucking throwing needles and shooting drugs all over their neighborhood. So at nighttime, it's super, super dangerous, super dangerous. One time I was sleeping in an abandoned church and uh, 
I hear I hear a girl screaming and there's all these other guys and I feel feel like such a fucking punk Chad because I didn't get up. I laid there like a coward and listened to her scream for her life. And they were in there raping her. The next morning, I thought it was a bad dream. So I walked to the back of the church and looked in there and she was in there dead. Um, I walked away and went and told and was telling my buddies about it. We went back there two weeks later, Chad, walked in that church. All you could smell was the body. It was still laying there. Wow, man. I mean, <laughs> unbelievable. So let's talk a little bit about when you come home, you're back in Maine, still using, you rob your parents. Let's talk about that. Okay, so the girl and and my brother that that had picked me up, um, we started we started trafficking. Um, I was bringing her back and forth to Philly, um, grabbing O's of meth, and meth was never my drug. I wasn't really on it, but um, I was selling it. I was bringing it back to Maine, and I was essentially running the bag up for this girl. And uh, at some point. I fucked the bag up and uh, I knew a quick recovery was firearms, you know, because down in Philly, a three or $400 pistol can fetch you an onion or two. So my, my thinking behind it at the time was, um, I don't know what I was thinking. The camera was literally looking directly at me and I just didn't even think it through. All I thought is I fucked the money up. I'm dope sick. I'll worry about it after. So I took the pistols, had her go to Philly. I fenced them. I got myself well. And then I went on the run. <laughs> what does a pistol go for in Philly, man, when you're, you know, you're out there using to the dudes look at you like, oh, man, this dude's just a, it's a drug addict, man. We're about to get this for whatever. Normally, but being that we own a pawn shop and I, you know, I deal with all walks of life and, um, I can essentially get my hands on anything and I know a little bit about everything. Um, you know, you can't, you can't really do that with me, but somebody that was super desperate that had nothing, they might fuck around and give you a bundle of dope. But, um, you know, I know my pistols. I know, I know what they go for and, you know, so it is what it is. Um, but I got an ounce of peace for him. Yep. So now you walk into this federal courthouse, eventually they arrest you. How much time do they sentence you to? Um, they wanted to career me. I got caught with an empty bag of dope in Virginia. So that wasn't, I guess, however the feds line up. So they used the diamond felony against me and they used uh, my drug trafficking. They didn't use the, the third felony in Virginia because it was an empty bag, Didn't wasn't a qualifying crime in the feds, so they weren't able to, what is it, an 876, or eight, they weren't able to get that from me. They were telling my parents that they were gonna give me a 20 year sentence, but it didn't qualify the crime. So when I went in there, and it also helped keep in mind that the victim of the crime is my mother, and she went to court for me, um, telling them, you know, my sons never stole pistols from me, please be lenient. And then, you know, the sexual abuse came into hand too, Chad, so. Um, they were only, they only gave me the 60 month sentence. 60 month sentence. Tell the people how old you are when you're sentenced to 60 months. Um, I'm 31, 31 years old, 32 years old. 31, 32 years old. You're sentenced to 60 months, but what prison do you go to? Cause that's what, that's what I'm getting to. I want people to understand that even with 60 months, you can end up in some pretty dangerous places. Okay. So. I only had 21 points, so I was FCI bound. Um, they used the pandemic to put a management variable on me and sent me to USP Canaan was my first stop. USP Canaan. What's it like when you get to Canaan? Um, so they're still on lockdown. It's the pandemic. So um, there's no visit. There's no contact. So essentially, when I first get there, the prison's cool, Chad. People that normally would have drug habits are healthy. They got their weight up. They haven't been able to get their hands on a piece of Suboxone for five, six months. If one comes through from the bus, they're going for $1,200, $1,400 apiece. So people are sober. 
for the most part. And, you know, this is where shit gets a little crazy. So they're like, who you run with? So I was told to go Boston, that Boston's got a very thorough car, this, that, and the third. But I get I get misconstrued with the idea of this independent thing. So you hear independent, you know, you think it is what it is. So I go in a cell with a guy named... He's got a 40-year sentence, and he got sent there for stabbing a guy from USP Hazleton. Um, he's a tattoo artist. And he kind of shows me the ropes. Um, so I'm a white independent, not knowing that independent is probably the largest car on the yard. You know what I mean? Um, there's a, we have a yard dog. His name's Scotty Bones. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. I know who Scotty Bones is. He's our yard dog. Um, I've heard bad things. I've heard good things. Um, I don't know his backstory, but for the most part, um, it was okay, Tad. It was all right. It was all right. Um, he, I go and meet him. Um, they had already heard about me before I got there. Um, a lot of the main guys, we, we all know who we are, who, who each other are. It's a small state. There's only a few of us from Maine. So we all have done time prior. So they were looking forward to me getting there because I'm an asset to the car. Um, I, I train doing mixed martial arts for a long time. Um, I do weapon demonstrations, nunchucks, bow staff. Um, I'm American kickboxer. So a lot of people. No, people are going to be on here. Hold on. So people will be on here. So my man's dude's Kevin, bro. Right. Well, people know me. They know who I am. Look me up. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, it is what it is. It's uh, I don't. I don't go around telling people that, um, but my friends know at the prison, there's people there that, um, I tumble, I, I do parkour, backflip, front flips, you know, I'm a gymnast. So, um, I'm, I'm a, I'm an asset to the car. So I tell them, um, I want to do this challenge program. I want to get the fuck up out of here, but I want to do my work. Well, Scotty Bones tells me, you know, what do you got for a sentence? This, that, and the third. And he's all proactive about guys that want to do the program. So I go to the program and I'm not there two weeks before I get my work call. Work call. Tell the people what work call is. So a work call is essentially stabbing or, or crushing somebody off the line that violated our politics. But the thing is, is a lot of times your work call, um, it's, situation so this guy his name was timothy england he was a big white boy uh he uh was serving a 45 year sentence he was the legal beagle for for the challenge program he was essentially trying to do what you do and doing people's motions and stuff and uh he had left b2 um with a with a little bit of a debt he owed 400 dollars on the card table so we had to cross him off the line for it because they thought he was ducking in the challenge program. So I wake up that morning. They tell me it's got to happen before dinner. And I go, man, I can't sit here all day with this anxiety thinking about doing this. I'm going to just go now. So I grab the unders and uh, I tell him, you got to come with me. So he didn't really want to, but he did. And uh, so we're in the middle of our meeting. You know, they got the chairs set up in alphabetical order. All the treatment staff were on the floor. All the inmates were on the floor. And I act like I got to use the bathroom. And as he's getting, because he got up, he had stood up for something and walked over by the ice machine. So I sent my buddy upstairs to go down around the other side of the stairs as I walked over towards him. And I took flight on him. And uh, and uh, I, I thought I did a pretty good job, but. According to the write-up, it was an assault without seriously injury. So we beat him until the cops, you know, they're screaming, where's the weapon? Where's the weapon? Because there was blood everywhere. But uh, I had a couple fight bites because when I had hit him, it had took out, it broke a bunch of his teeth. So it had, he, it broke his cheekbone. I punched out two of his teeth, um, plus several other teeth and split his palate and his mouth. He needed surgery. But the write-up says, um, 
224, assault without serious injury. So that just gives you the idea of the BOP's idea of a serious injury, if that's not serious. so. Well, that's because they don't want that to go on the paperwork that they had this many serious you know, assaults at their facility. We've had a few, but they weren't too serious. These are, you know, they don't put the details. They, they write it how they want. They do that, you know, on purpose so that right. the justice and other people don't get involved. So they kind of fudge the paperwork, right? Right. It's a, cra a crazy world, but for $400, a debt, this guy's the legal beagle. He's got a $400 debt on the card table. He pretty much gets, you know, brutally assaulted, right? Yep. How do you feel about that? How do you feel like, you know, going to attack another dude pretty much that you don't even know? You just, you, you have to attack. What's it? Well, he was my neighbor. My neighbor, man. He lived beside. He was the one, I, when I first moved over there, I hadn't been able to make store. So he was actually the one that, that put the pack together for me. He, he's the one that was, gave me my coffee and, and all that shit. So, um, it's, it's, it's fucking wild, man. I'm, I'm, I'm deeply ashamed of it, Chad. It's like, and when we were in the hall together and he's in the, he comes back from the thing, you know, I'm sitting there and I'm, I literally teared up. I'm like, I'm so sorry, bro. And he's like, nah, man, you did me a favor. If anything, getting me the fuck out of here, man. So I hope he's all right wherever he landed. It's a sad life that we live in there, isn't it? Yeah, damn sure is. Did it affect you mentally and emotionally? I'm so fucked up, Chad. You might be fucked up now, but you know what, man? You're an intelligent dude. You're going to make it. Um, Maybe I should... Oh, not, only, not only am I going to make it, I'm going to explode. On you. <laughs> I'm about to blow up. I'm I'm, I'm, I'm going to be successful. <laughs> well, I'm glad that you know... I'm. Well, that's the first part, right? You got to believe it. If you don't believe it, no one else will. There's no doubt about it. I already know I am. So now you're in Canaan, you know, you're kind of, you put in this work. How long do you go to the hole for, for such a brutal assault? Tell the people. So I didn't see, I didn't see the DHL. It, it took, they had to send, you know, they had to forward it because of the injuries. They had to forward it to the, to the FBI to see if they wanted to pick it up. So it took 22 days for me to see a DHO. And then he turned around and gave me 30 more days that started from that time. So I did 54 days in the hole and lost all privileges for a year. You know, but losing your privileges don't really mean shit. Because if you want something, you just send money to someone else, right? What? It's fucking crazy. That's what I had to do, though, yeah. Were you uh, still, a, you know, messing around with the drugs in there? Um, no, not really. Uh, Suboxone so once in a while until I was able to get on my MAP program. So I've been on that MAP. Chaining, place where your correctional officer gets murdered by an inmate, right? Yeah, so that, that happened before I got there, but it was in my unit. The stains are still on the floor. How do the cops treat the prisoners there? Because I've been there. I went through there in transit, and they treated white dudes like they were pieces of shit, even worse than anyone else. It's, so I would have thought that they would have, you know, being, I would have thought that they were better to the white guys is, is what I would have thought, but they're not. It's the exact opposite. So they hate white boys there. They hate the fact that we assault people. They hate the fact that they're all most of the white boys are on drugs. They think they're all junkies. They hate us. We had no TV in C1, no tables. The cell I was in was a DC cell. I didn't get my own cell until I put in work. I was finally able to claim my cell, and that's my cell. You know, also, I think a lot of the cops, there was some pushback because they felt like the white dudes in the unit should have saved Williams, the cop that was killed. That we were supposed to jump on that on that guy and save Eric Williams, yeah. How do you feel about that? Do you feel like the white dude should have saved him because he was a white cop? Um, you know, Chad, it's like, I'm going to keep it a buck with you, man. I, I fucking hate cops, man, you know? But that's something that's been instilled in me. But um, at the same time, cops save lives, man. It's like, if that, when we get later on, if 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 the Mexican mafia jump had been jumping on me, it would have been them cops that saved my fucking life. You know what I mean? It's it's them responding that saves your life. So, um, that man didn't deserve that. Um, I was told he was a peckerhead that he had took a radio from the guy and all of his radio equipment. Um, but I don't know, bro. Um, help you? Let me help you because prison politics say. You're not supposed to help the police. You help the police, you could end up dead. Now you're a cop and you're a rat. You're a snitch. Prison politics, where are you going to go after that? And then there's the flip side where people say, well, had you have helped the cops, 
you'd have been in danger, and they would have sent you off to USB Beaumont. And everybody would be like, oh, that's the fucking dude that helped the cop. And now you could end up dead. So it's kind of a catch-22, right? Um, and, and, you know, not on no racial shit, but this is what it is. This is the system. This isn't, hey, man, because I'm white, the white cops should treat me better. I mean, people think that in their mind, but that's not really how it works. You know, right. you know, a lot of cops treat everybody like they're a piece of shit. 90% of them treat you like you're a piece of shit because of what you said. You know, all white dudes are junkies in here. This is, why, this is how they feel. Not what I'm saying. This is what the cops feel. And they just feel like you're a straight piece of shit. So anyway, man, you know, after that incident, what else is going on at USP Canaan? Um, so really, so at first it, it's, it's, it, at first it's pretty calm. Um, but then you got, so you got the Sereno there and you got one of their, one of their main leaders, one of the head black hands, his name's Wet Shy. Um, he's, a, he's an old man. Um, but fuck is he dangerous chad it's like i finally understand what that black hand means it's like what the touch of death this put this man puts that hand on you and it's over with so there's a couple guys there there's one by the name of psycho i guess there's a few psychos in the system <laughs> but um right um that's i don't know if he's trying to become a black hand or i guess they're they're what they're all trying to become a black hand right is that their main goal? I mean, I think, uh, I think a lot of them dudes, man, that, you know, that's what they look at. They're like, hey, man, that's the top of the food chain. Someday I'm going to be up there. If not, I mean, they wouldn't just be running around putting in work. And, you know, I mean, sometimes it just got to be a part of something. I've, I've run into guys and, you know, that gang, other gangs are like, yo, <clears throat> they're doing what they got to do to make it. You know what I mean? They have to be part of this. This is where they're from. And if they ain't part of it, then you know what the other end is, right? They're, they might be leaving on a stretcher, right? He fucking butchered this dude in our unit man butchered him um it was this other guy was sitting he was one of their buddies was sitting at the table and i don't know what it was over man but he had two knives and he run up and it looked like something out of fucking mortal Kombat, man it looked like baraka or something this man had him on the ground and was just fucking digging in his guts with him and it seemed like it went on for two minutes straight i was back there in the hall with him and uh when the, when the cops came to the door and uh, it was five months later and I heard the guy say, uh, he's still alive. So I guess they were hoping that uh, he lived the year because I guess if he dies after a year, the charge is less. <laughs> crazy, man. You know, just, just a crazy life. Some people don't understand this shit. You know, you get people on here that do documentaries on YouTube and they tell you stories about other people. But you lived around these dudes. I lived around these dudes. Um, and I, I've got a documentary coming out on Donnie LaFond in, in blue from SAC. The, oh. The, oh, we can get to SAC too. So, okay, so I put in my work. I'm throwing out a challenge program and I'm returned to the unit. Now, when I'm returned to the unit, now I'm a righteous white boy. You know, I put in work. I got my own cell. We don't have a TV or a cable yet because I guess some guy named Red had sold it before we got there. I'm sure you heard the story. They hit him and they hit him there and in Beaumont. They stabbed him up. But so the Southsiders were essentially. Stop. Hold on. Let me stop you. They stabbed Red up in these other jails because he sold the white table, white cells, right? Yep. Yep. He's been stabbed every place he's gone to. It's followed him. So that's one of them violations that he's never going to be able to um, get away from. So in, in order to get to one of these dropout yards, um, the threat's got to be very real. You know, you can't just say you're scared. You have to be um, assaulted multiple times before you're going to get there, you know? I know. I know exactly what you're talking about. And eventually, there, even there, um, it's still just as fucking bad. <laughs> so. So I was saying, so I go back to the unit and they're like, there was only ever three white boys in that unit, Chad. So that's cool. There's no, there's no, there's not enough of us for problems, you know? And I got the unit. They give me the keys for our unit. So, uh, and they're like, have you met automatic? 